I beg you to try it, Patricio. Let me get this straight, Carla. You disagree on the weapon, you disagree on the number of blows. <laughs> Listen to me, Patricio. You dare once in your life. Hi, people. Trish Wood here. I hope this show works out because... I still have a little bit of the Coco Rona. <laughs> I mean, really. And as an unvaxxed person, let's say proudly unvaxxed person at this stage of the game, I am really proud that I resisted it. I feel that I have to give you a scorecard of what has happened to me uh, when I got COVID last week. So here's here's the deal. Um, I recorded last week's show on Wednesday, and I felt quite good. Thursday, I had a sore throat, and by Wednesday, I felt like I'd been hit by a nuclear bomb, and that's no lie. It was a fairly serious rearrangement of the DNA, and uh, accompanied by a brutal, brutal, brutal headache, like a a life-changing headache. It was awful, which I had for about two or three days. That was the worst of it for me was the headache. I had a fever, uh, 101, 102. Um, but I never felt like I was going to die. And, and so, and so here's what I want to say. This is my second bout of COVID. I had another one last year, you may recall. And I think there was a week I actually didn't even do the show at all. Right. Because of it or something like that. I can't remember exactly what we did, but I was much sicker than that I am now or was now I'm almost better now. Um, but here is what it's like for me. I, I I sort of gave you a list of the symptoms that I had. And then the reason I think for me it's um, a little maybe tougher than my kids who also had COVID recently again and, and are vaccinated, although not boosted, boosted against my dead body, young men, never, um, is that I have three comorbidities. I have three, right? Age, I'm not going to say how old I am, but I do. It qualifies. Um, weight. Um, also again, I'm not going to play the numbers game with y'all, but, (laughs) but I did gain a substantial amount of weight during uh, the lockdown, like the two years of COVID lockdowns and stuff, because I was locked away and depressed and stopped going to the gym and Pilates and all that stuff. So, so that's number two. And then number three for a comorbidity for me is that I have a a quite a serious uh, iron deficiency. So, even with those three things, that's all that I had a couple of days of really bad headache, sick for about, I guess, maybe five days in total or something. I'm testing negative now. I have a residual cough, but but I'm doing OK. So um, I hope I'm, I'm a little low energy. So I, I hope that the show meets our usual quality control standards. I'm doing my very, very best because New Year's is coming up. Right. So that's pretty fun for us. Um, and I am feeling somewhat optimistic about the future. I don't know why I am, but I am. And I think we all have to kind of hold on to that for now. Just, you know, um, we have a saying in the rooms in AA, uh, fake it till you make it. And what that means is sometimes just pretending you're in a good mood can put you in a good mood. So that's what we're doing now. We're doing that. Our guest today is a gift. His name is Leighton Woodhouse. And he was on the show just a few months ago talking about some work he's been doing with Michael Schellenberger, who I also greatly admire. But he is one of the people who went into the Twitter building in San Francisco with a group of super talented journos like Barry Weiss and Michael Schellenberger and Matt Taibbi and all these guys and girls who you should be funding and reading about and went through the Twitter files. Imagine that for me, an old school journo, yippee, I would have loved that, even though I still can't travel to the States. So it would never have been me. And I'm not high profile enough anyway, but I, I, I'm a little bit jealous, a little bit jelly that they got to go in and do this. And so what they were going through these documents and digital files and actual files was looking for what was fueling the Twitter suppression on a whole bunch of fronts from Hunter Biden laptop to the COVID documents, which as you know, affected people we, we admire and love. So it's, it's quite an interesting story, just the mechanics of it. Right. And uh, we're going to talk to him about that. Um, I want to talk to you very briefly about a series I just watched on Amazon. I rarely 
rarely recommend things as wholeheartedly as I will recommend um, a TV drama called Sherwood. It's a BBC production. And um, I believe that uh, it's on Amazon through BritBox, but you're going to have to just check that out for yourself. It's called Sherwood. Massive, massive positive reviews for this show. And I wasn't expecting it. We stumbled into it while I was sick and my husband was home because it was Christmas holidays looking for something to watch. And I was completely gobsmacked by it. You must watch it. It's a show about um, some murders in a little northern English town where there had been a working class town, a mining town, where there had been a lot of labor unrest decades before the kind of unrest that destroys communities, right? They're the scabs who cross the picket line and the the striking miners who put up the picket line. And those rifts can carry on actually generationally. Um, and there's a really good meditation in some of the the uh, later episodes about how powerful people line up to divide us because it's better for them if we're fighting. And there's a wonderful little bit with a young white working collar kid from this town who says that nobody cares about them. He has no future, you know. So it's a really interesting metaphor in a sense for COVID a bit, but it's also just a wonderful, wonderful, uh, worthwhile series that you should spend some time on. It's called Sherwood, made by the BBC, carried on Amazon Prime. It was produced this year. I, sus- I suspect it's going to win a whole bunch of BAFTA awards. Um, here's a little gem that just crossed my transom. Vaccination confidence in Canada, online conversation and audience analysis. So, so the health public health minister is going to be doing a little bit of research on us in preparation for increased vaccination, education, promotion, and outreach. The public health agency of Canada is requiring the services of a consultant to analyze the vaccine related conversations on social media and P hack social media initiatives and campaign performance. (sighs) Okay. So they're still at it, right? They're never going to leave us alone. Are they actually paying money for this? Like people don't want the vaccine anymore. Get it through your thick head, Prime Minister Trudeau. You bought too many and your terror campaign is not working anymore. So before we get to to Leighton, I just want to do my little pitch and start off by saying it was so fun that so many of you bought merchandise for Christmas this year. Really fun to see. And some of you even posted pictures on my Twitter feed uh, wearing various hats and things. So thank you. They look wonderful. And it's great to see the message getting out there into the no hat, you know, was really popular. Critical thinking cap. We got a, um, a picture of somebody wearing that. So thank you for buying those. They support the show. Very grateful. You can support us on Patreon, PayPal, and also on Substack, where I will be dropping a piece. I'm, I was delayed. I'm sorry by the COVID. I, I wasn't writing. So I've got something coming up. Pretty good for you too, I hope. Um, Substack is our preferred because it is totally free speech. It's wide open. We don't have to watch our P's and Q's there. And so uh, do just even a small monthly amount the price of a a Starbucks or whatever coffee you're drinking these days. And when when you listen to Leighton and and the work that they did in Twitter to sort out this mess of of, um, censorship and doing the bidding of the FBI, which is absolutely McCarthyism, you know, we, not me personally, because I didn't go there, but we're the people fighting this battle for you. And um, it's clear that legacy media is not just failing, it failed. We don't have a working media in this country or in America anymore. In the, in the UK, there's still kind of residual bits, but, but uh, we, we don't in our, these two Western democracies in Canada and America, our legacy media is a failed entity. And all they do is bitch and moan about how mean the critics are, right? And Taylor Lorenz, oh, they're being mean to me. And there, there's a couple of people, Canadian reporters who do the same thing. They bitch and moan on, on social media about how mean we are when we point out all the stories they got wrong. It's just pathetic. And let me just say something from the olden days too. 
when I was being taught journalism and practicing actual journalism, we were told to never use me or I in a sense. We never talked about ourselves. It was verboten, right? And that's why starting the podcast for me was very hard because the successful podcasts are the ones who actually have the courage to reach out and um, and connect with their audience. And you do that by being a little bit more personal. So I had to go against all of my, you know, my training and start doing things that felt uncomfortable. Now they feel wonderful because I've made such wonderful connections with you all. But but legacy media is not supposed to be doing that. And they should all stay off social media too, because the more I read about them on social media, the less credibility they have. It's ridiculous, right? So, so supporting us, um, all of us who are doing the work of, um, of old school journalism and, uh, and trying to write this ship at some point, I don't know how we're going to do it. Please support us. It means, it means a lot. And uh, a lot of us have put quite a bit on the line too. Like when I started my podcast, people, I didn't even have a Twitter feed. I, I had no way to promote myself. I wasn't known that well outside of Canada as a journalist. So it was a it was a, a tall, tall hill to climb to get where we are. So please think about that if you like what we're doing. And if you don't like what we're doing, let me know why. You know, take me to the woodshed. I'll listen um, because uh, it's your show too. And I think I know what you want, and I hope I hope we're giving it to you. And, of course, we do have a merch store. New stuff coming there, too, for the new year. So do support us that way. Um, and so now I want to get to my, my interview with, with Leighton Woodhouse and, and just say to you, you know, at the beginning you'll hear me say to Leighton, well, I was hoping that, you know, Barry Weiss and certain people in this collective wouldn't weren't going to do the COVID documents, right? And I didn't mean that they shouldn't be doing them. But they I, I, I was hoping and it turns out I was right because they brought David Zweig on board that the the medical stuff should be vetted by somebody who's been swimming around in the in the more technical side of the COVID uh, COVID reporting because it's hard work and you can't just kind of step into it and know it. You've got to really understand it. That's why David Zweig is such a magnificent choice. So working with David Zweig is uh, Leighton Woodhouse, the best name of any journalist working today and also one of the best, best minds. So here's my interview with Leighton. Hi, Leighton. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Very, I, I'm terrific. And I'm, I'm very, very happy to, to have you back. Um, and, and especially under these circumstances, and I'll tell you why, because I've been banging on a bit on this show about how when it came time to review some of the COVID documents and other documents at Twitter, we needed people who really understood that story. And so when David Swig mentioned that you were involved, I was really, really happy about that, because let's face it. You know, Matt Taibbi's brilliant and Barry Weiss is they're all smart in their own way, but they don't they weren't that great on COVID. So um, it's it's nice that Elon ha- had the sense and, and David Zweig had the sense to bring all you smarty pants people onto the team. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> right. So so how did it happen? Did you get a call from somebody or how did it work? Um, I was brought in by Michael Schellenberger, who is um, a friend and uh, colleague. Um, And Barry had brought, Barry Weiss had brought Michael in. um, But I also, you know, I'm friends with Barry and I write for Barry. So, um, so, uh, so that wasn't, so she said, yeah, absolutely. When he suggested bringing me in. Um, So, so uh, from the beginning, it was um, Matt and Barry, and then shortly after myself and Michael, yeah. and then we brought in Lee Fong and yeah. David Swig, um, and uh, and various folks at the Free Press, and a couple of Matt Taibbi's people, um, and that was basically the team that was reviewing the Twitter files. No, oh, I you know and I was so happy about that. I could not, if I was going to curate the list myself as an old school journalist. Uh, I, I'm a big fan of Lee Fung too, and obviously David Zwag and and Barry and and Michael Schellenberger is one of my favorite writers right now. He's just knocking it out of the park weekly on a Substack. So lucky us! And I hope for my listeners who are trying to make their way through the land of independent media that they 
heard those names and will go to their sub stacks and follow what they're doing because this is the new journalism. And mm. as I've said about Substack before, it is what the New Yorker used to be back in the day. <laughs> <laughs> when the New Yorker actually meant something to us, right? Yeah. So that so that's great. So you got a call. Does that mean you went into the building? Like, did you go to San Francisco or Palo Alto, wherever it is, and walk into the San building? Um, San Francisco, and and yes, we had. In fact, the only place we were able to do the review was in the building. We, there was a, a a room that was set aside for us, a small, fairly cramped room. Um, yeah. And uh, and we weren't um, allowed to look at look through the archives. Like we weren't allowed to put our hands on the computer, look through the archives ourselves because of legal liability questions around um, uh, violating users' terms of service. Um, mm-hmm. So you know, t- Twitter was to to its credit very careful with us around making sure that. You know, we weren't um, able to see information that we had no interest in seeing and that it right. would have been unethical for us to see, which is regular users information. And so for that reason, they had Twitter employees and lawyers um, going over all, you know, we would request searches and they would approve the searches. And well, they didn't approve the searches. They, they, I don't want to make it sound as if they were, you know, um, being selective. We would give yeah. them the search. They would do the searches um, and then they would come back with the results and we would be able to sift through thousands and thousands of pages of results from those, from those keyword searches. Um, yeah. And, uh, and so we weren't viewing any user data. It was just employee communications, um, yeah. but we could only do it within the office because of the, because of that whole setup. It's not as if they just gave us a password and said, um, go crazy. That would have been unethical. Um, so, we so yeah we were stuck in this room and um, and uh, sifting through these documents, reading thousands and thousands of uh, emails and Slack messages, and most you know ninety nine percent of which was very mundane and quite yeah. boring. Yeah. Um, you know, looking for um, these these sort of Easter eggs, looking for these um, these uh, uh, little needles in the haystack that sh- that told a story, um, yeah. and I think we uncovered quite a bit of it. So just a few more details. This is like, okay, this is the movie scene. Clearly there's going to be a movie about this one day. (laughs) There should be (laughs) scripted drama of some sort. Who's going to play Leighton? Um, (laughs) Maybe, um, I don't know who should play Ben, Ben Affleck. Would he maybe be good or I don't know. (laughs) Who should play you? Uh, My wife thinks that George, uh, what's that guy's name? I never remember his name with the three names. The guy was on uh, Third Rock from the Sun. Joseph Gordon-Levitt? Uh, yeah, that guy. And that's the, My wife thinks that, that, he, that he's the guy who would play me in a movie if, <laughs> if, uh, if I were, were ever so fortunate, but uh, I'm not sure I agree. <laughs> that's so funny. Yeah, well, it will be a movie. I mean, wow. I remember Spotlight, you know. Did you see Spotlight? Yeah, yeah which I yeah. cried all the way through. My husband kept saying, why are you crying? Over this, you know, and of course, yeah, only have I seen Spotlight. I was actually working for Participant Media at the time that Spotlight won the Oscar, which is um, the, wow. the production company that that made the film, and oh. I got to hold it in my own hands. You did? Oh my god! Well, for me, like being like really old school, um, he, you know, he's why are you crying? Obviously, one cries for children who are raped by priests, no doubt about that. Yeah. But I was also crying for the fact that no one's doing that anymore. No one's doing that kind of. There's a team of people, and they're well paid, and they work mm. day and night, and you know all the stuff. That I just, I just reminded me of the olden days, um, and um, and it yeah, was. I wrote a right? Substack about uh, uh, something in that vein, just about the fact that now instead instead of that, what you have now is mainstream media literally running defense for the state when other people are doing that kind of work. Um, I mean, the, the reception in the mainstream media from the Twitter files would be like analogous to mm-hmm. if but when, when the spotlight team exposed the Catholic church, if the rest of the media spent all their energy trying to discredit the story and defend the Catholic church, <laughs> like that, that that's the, anal- that's the 
uh, analogy for uh, for the the MSM's reception of of the revelations of the Twitter files, in my opinion. I, I, I think it's a thousand percent. Yeah. I, I completely agree with you. I completely agree. But the other thing about Spotlight, too, is that I don't know how many people are on the team, three, four people, very dedicated managing editor, absolutely pure conviction that what they were doing was right, trying to make sure they had all the evidence before they pounced, even though it was clear they were right. Like, it was so old school yeah. you know i mean it was really it was all and i i came from a show like 60 minutes where you know, we behaved that way it was called the fifth estate it was a big canadian investigative tv news show but that's how we operate a big team and we flew mm-hmm. around and we cared deeply and stuff and now it's just kind of like a quaint party trick that people yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah so i just want to get back to the scene at um twitter did they bring in food for y'all or did you have to get your own? And if so, what was it? <laughs> combination. <laughs> combination. They did not bring us in food, but there was a, you know, there, there's a, on certain days they have um, a big buffet, uh, mm-hmm. uh, cafeteria style buffet for employees. And so we were able to, uh, to just go and, and get our food at the, along with the rest of the employees at their sort of little mess hall. Um, and, uh, and on most days that wasn't actually available to us. And we just went downstairs. There's a big food court downstairs um, in the buildings. So. <laughs> okay. Well, well, from the food. TikTok videos, you know, those young women, this is my fourth day at Twitter and we're going into the yoga room and here is the meditation right. room and <laughs> right. And here's the, du- the dumpling bar and the, this and bar and everything. So yeah, I assume that you were probably well looked yeah. after. Um, and then also, uh, go I mean, ahead. There was- there's some amenities, but it wasn't it wasn't it wasn't quite as posh as as uh, as as I actually would have guessed. But um, but there there's a nice cafe, but you have to pay for it. Yeah, um, like that's you know the cafe is part of the is in the office and it's a very fancy cafe. But but again, it's not free. Um, there's you know there's there's a generous snack bar, but that's the same with a lot of offices. It wasn't actually quite as as uh as pampered as uh as i think other tech companies are yeah and and then was, was alon there like did he open the door and say come on in people or did you just show up and everybody knew you were supposed to be there we we were given passes um so we had um you know sort of those fob pass things um to get <laughs> yeah. into the elevator and to get into the to the office and then to get into the work area within the office um, and Elon did pop in from time to time into the room. There was a day that I was not there that he sat down and basically and talked for like two, two and a half hours, um, to Barry and Matt and Michael Schellenberger. Yeah. Um, I wasn't there that day, but I was there other days when he just popped in for a few minutes, which was, uh, you know, a, a, a surreal experience. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, but, uh, so he was in and out. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, but but for the most part out you know he was a busy guy um for the most part we were we were for 99% of the time we were in the room just by ourselves or with one twi- one or two twitter employees who were just helping with the mechanics of the of the search process how does elon present in person is he like a big guy like a a big presence or is he more of a nerdy small like how does he fill a room uh, in my opinion, he was pretty casual. Actually, he's—I mean, he's a tall guy. Um, yeah. He's uh, my—that's my recollection. Um, not super tall, but on the tall side. Yeah. Um, and uh, and he's, you know, for a for a billionaire and for a very <laughs> important dude, he's um, he was like very casual and um, uh, sort of candid. Um, I mean, it was just. Uh, he answered questions pretty straightforwardly um, yeah. and uh, and didn't seem to have any pricklish pr- sort of, he wasn't prickly about our asking him questions. Wow. Yeah. Um, there was no, you know, PR purse handler um, sitting there correcting him. He just would pop in by himself and just kind of rap with us. And, um, and yeah, it was um, surprisingly normal of an interaction. Um, Did you like him? uh, Yeah, I liked him. Um, I mean, I like most people, (laughs) you know, I know you uh, do. most people like most people when you meet them in person, right? Yeah, so that's true. Yeah. Um, So, so, you know, it's not as if uh, that would be any different from anybody else. And it's not as if I got to know him well or anything. Um, But yeah, I, I, I liked him. 
Well, you just said something that really reinforces my war against work from home, right? I, I think we do like each other if we're forced to be in the same room with each other. It's more likely we'll like each other than not. Yeah. And and I do feel that in a lot of conflicts in our world right now, it's because people are interacting only on screens and not not in this, mm-hmm. not at the coffee machine, right? Not at the espresso mm-hmm. machine in their office. Um, and and I, I mean, obviously, I mean, Elon or Elon, I guess, did smoke a joint with Joe Rogan a couple of years ago. So yeah. pretty relaxed <laughs> fella. Um, yeah. And then my last question, just on the mechanics of it, as, again, being old school, of course, I'm envisioning you guys sitting with boxes of documents like we used to, but that's a ludicrous idea because this is a digital platform. So physically, what was the workspace like for you guys at a big round table? You know, how many laptops did you have? Did you have big files of paper too? Or how did that work? We were in a small conference room. Um, and uh, at any given time, there were anywhere between like two to three to um, like 10 of us um, at, at the at the most crowded. Um, maybe not 10, maybe eight or nine. Um, and uh, And we had... There were a couple of laptops that were owned by Twitter um, that we uh, that had sort of that 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 were capable of doing the searches, and yeah. those were handled by Twitter uh, personnel, not by us, as yeah. I explained before, for those legal uh, protecting the terms of service um, uh, reasons. And then, of course, we all had our own computers, um, and we had a, a somewhat tedious process of. Um, looking at these files and then having to copy them onto Google Docs um, so that we could review them, uh, you know, from from by remote because w- when we weren't in the room, um, and uh, and then I had and then I personally I had a bunch of camera equipment just because I'm I also do documentary filmmaking yes. and I want yes I know you do yeah yeah um, wow that, that's so, fascinating yeah go ahead sorry that, that's what it looked like physically yeah and so la- last kind of fluff question but but did, 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 was there a real bond of camaraderie like you you guys shared a moment in history right like this is at least in my mind the way i think about the world i think about that as a moment in history did you did you experience it that way with each other and are you kind of like the god you know the band of brothers from the foxhole or something now, or what <laughs> well um well the funny thing is you know i actually am was already friends or quite friendly with most of the people involved. So Michael Schellenberg and I are, are close friends and we talk daily. Yeah. Um, Lee Fong and I have been close friends for years. Um, yeah. uh, Barry is a uh, Barry. I also consider a friend and Barry mm-hmm. and I write for Barry quite a bit. Um, and so mm-hmm. I therefore talk to her quite a bit. Yeah. Uh, Matt Aby, I also consider a friend and I have, and I have um, done a, a video project for him before in the past. Um, we don't, we don't talk as frequently, nearly as frequently as I do with, with the aforementioned people, but yeah. uh, we're quite familiar. Um, and so these were all, you know, kind of friends. Um, and then, um, and then another Peter Savodnik is the editor is an editor for Barry Weiss and he was in the room sometimes and he's my editor when I write for, for Barry. So I talked okay. to him all the time. Yeah. So it was like a lot. And then there were, there were, then there were a few, I didn't know Davis Wag before. Um, mm-hmm. I, there, there were some people from the free press who I hadn't met before. A oh, Susie Weiss, who's Barry's um, sister was also in the room and she's um, somebody I I've spoken to um, uh, a fair amount in the past. Yeah. So, like almost everybody were people I, I already knew. Um, right. And uh, but yeah, I mean, being stuck in a room, I mean, I kind of, I, I, I think I joked a couple of times that it felt like college. Um, <laughs> yeah. Being stuck in a room at sometimes odd hours and, and, um, and just like, you know, that, that with our feet up again on the desks, like pulling kind of cram sessions under a deadline, um, kind of felt a little collegiate. Yeah. Uh, but, um, but yeah, it was, it was a, I think we were, we definitely became, more familiar with each other. It's hard not to when you're sitting in a cramped room under somewhat stressful conditions um, uh, yeah. working on a project. Well, it must have felt in a way like an old school newsroom, you know, under pressure, crammed in a room, important things happening. Like that's kind of yeah, what, yeah. Right? So it <laughs> what it used to, an old, an old newspaper newsroom. Um, and, and just the second part of my question was, did you have a sense 
when you were doing the work that you were part of an historic moment too? Like was, was that discussed or were you just working and then you thought maybe more about that later? Like how did that idea? We knew it was a big deal. I mean, I think the funny thing is that like, in a sense, like we were, our job was to make it into a historical moment, right? Because we were looking through these documents and either we were going to find significant things that were very newsworthy or we weren't. And this yeah. opportunity was not going to be a historical moment. It was going to be, you know, as uh, it would, it was, you know, there was always the threat that it would be what the MSM has chosen to characterize it as anyway, as a yeah. man burger. Um, yeah. And, uh, and so, you know, it was up to us and, and to, 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 to uh, achieve something notable. I think we did. Um, and, oh, um, yeah. and so, um, but, but we did, uh, we certainly knew that, you know, we were in the middle of a media cycle of a, of a major news cycle and that, <clears throat> um, you know, at the point at which we published, there was no question that when we published, it was going to be, um, there was going to be a whole lot of attention to those threads um, that, that was just part of the mechanics of, of the process. Yeah. Um, so, you know, what, so in that sense, it, I guess it did, it felt as you, as you've, um, noted like an old school newsroom in the sense that it's like, you know, you put together the story and then you hit publish and you know, you're going to have an audience and, but you don't know how that audience is going to respond to your findings. Right. Uh, so we'd hit publish and then we, you know, but, but of course it's 2022. So you hit publish and you see, you, you get your audience response immediately, <laughs> yeah. um, which is, which is different from the spotlight days. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, it was, it was, I mean, it was exciting. Did you, did, did you have to resist the urge to shout out, Oh my God, look what I just found. And then read out snippets to people <laughs> like you, cause that could just go on forever if you were doing that. Right. So did you have to stop that or did you share some particularly juicy moments? Oh, we would definitely share share when we found stuff. Uh, I mean, <laughs> picture picture going through work emails and work Slack messages for hours and hours and hours. Of course, when you find something, you know your eyes are glazing over after a while. And of course, <laughs> yeah. when you find something, you're going to share it. And also, it's an iterative process, right? Like we would yeah. like we would say, "Hey, I've got this. Check this out and read it." And then other other you know, and other people who are looking at different threads would say, "Oh, well, that that lines up with." this email chronologically or this, this, this adds some texture to this particular revelation or, you know, it was an iterative process. So like you throw your discoveries out there so that you, we could all figure out what was going on and put together these, it kind of felt like putting together pieces of a puzzle. It was like, not to mix metaphors, but it was like finding a needle in a haystack and yeah. like putting, then taking those needles and putting them together into into a, 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 a into a picture of what was happening yeah. um, with all these, um, you know, pretty mundane files. So I, I'll yeah. get into the nuts and bolts of what you found, but I, I guess um, also, so in, in, in other countries, like I had my own difficulty with Twitter. It was not huge, uh, probably because I'm not big enough on there to, really to matter, or maybe because I have a Canadian account. I don't know if that affects their algorithms or not. The only time I was ever overtly punished, I know I was shadow banned for sure. I know that because lots of people were constantly writing me and saying, I'm not seeing your tweets. What's going on? I haven't seen a tweet from you in six months. And I'm like, well, I'm on there every morning. Um, but but the one I that they that they pulled me down over and demanded I remove the tweet, which I did, um, was about a Canadian CBC journalist who retired early over the way CBC was handling the COVID files, right? Which is no criticism of the narrative at all under any circumstances. And she was not just a person saying, oh, look at what a terrible job. She was in the newsroom when they were saying, we, we don't do those stories, or that might cause vaccine hesitancy, or you know, we have to do what public health tell, whatever, one of those kind of conversations, right? So, so it was quite an important interview because she was an eyewitness to the way editorial meetings in legacy media were handling some of the COVID issues very, very badly. And he, and I just promoted, this was an exclusive interview. She only gave one because um, I used to work there too. And, um, and they made me pull even my promotion down. So of that, right. So, so my question is, were you guys able to see 
Canadian streams, UK streams, where a lot of this was happening to, or were you completely confined to what was happening in America? No, we were able to see what was happening anywhere. Uh, you know, they like certainly in the in the interfaces that we were looking in, there were no um, distinctions between you know geographical areas. It's not as if there was a American database and then a Canadian database. Um, you know, it was all just uh, everything on Twitter. And you know, bear in mind that that we were we did look at profiles of specific individuals to see if they had been shadow banned mm -hmm. like Jay Sharia, for instance mm -hmm. but like for the most part we were not looking at users we were looking at employee communications um right, right. so you know we're we we're looking at communications that were taking place in the building that we were in and then also in their dc office um uh and so um so 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 it's, it's not as if we were um we even were looking at accounts abroad um except when we had a specific user who we had reason to believe had been quote unquote actioned, um, mm -hmm. uh, Jade Bhattacharya, in which case we would look at, uh, we were, you know, given access to, to that account and to that profile. And by the way, all we could see in that case was, you know, the account, like the, the, the history of the, the, what, um, uh, Twitter employees or bots, had done to that account, we weren't able to see a lot of information which would have been personal to that user. Yeah, um, they were very careful uh, to 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 not allow us access to that. Which you know, of course, we didn't. We weren't. We had no interest in access to that, and would not want to see that information. Um, but but for the most part, you know, again, we were just looking at Slack messages, emails, and um, correspondences between uh, Twitter staff for the most part, and as well as um, external communications between. Twitter employees and, for example, the FBI. So just hypothetically speaking, uh, if our prime minister, whose name is Justin Trudeau, mm -hmm. <laughs> like you didn't know that. Um, Trudeau. <laughs> if he had, you know, telephone, email, whatever, however these guys do it, uh, Twitter in Canada and said, I, you know, we want you to stop um, anybody who's overtly supporting the truckers or anybody who's shitting on our vaccine program, whatever, would that have shown up? Does the fact that it hasn't been, it, what's the expression a, a, is evidence of absence, whatever the expression is, but it, does the fact that it wasn't there mean that it wasn't done? I guess is what I'm trying to, to ask you or was it, well, there? maybe you saw it. Yeah. I mean, so first of all, um, you know, one should bear in mind that we're talk. this was like, it felt like an infinite amount of documentation. So like for all the people who are saying, why don't they just release the Twitter files to the public so we can all take a look at it? What there's, what those people are, are suggesting is logistically impossible. This is like, you know, it's probably millions of, of, uh, of discrete, communications because we're going this is going back years for a, a company of thousands of of employees who spend all day um digitally communicating with each other yeah um so this is a massive 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 um uh, uh, um um amount of data so it's like we we would have to look specifically for like if we were to look into the canadian truckers thing which we did not um, I wish I thought of that. It might have been a good thing to to look to look at. Um, but we would have to do a search to try to find communications specifically about that, and then maybe we would find it, and maybe we wouldn't. Yeah. And um, and and also, you know, we would have we would be looking for often. T not only would we be looking for communications about a certain issue, but we also have to pin it to a particular employee. Mm -hmm. Um. So like we would look at, for example, Yoel Roth, whose name comes up quite a bit in the Twitter files because he was yeah. the head of safety. We would be looking at his communications around Canadian truckers, for example. And like, a you know, if you think about like Yoel Roth and Jim Baker and these sort of characters who we we've um, who who are at the top of uh, of um, of Twitter's org chart we were looking at their communications because the most sensitive and critical stuff was the stuff that came to their attention, right. but they were the, of the iceberg, right? Most of the iceberg is underwater and, um, and the vast majority of these communications are being done by, um, by these, um, 
sort of just like low level people who are just flagging tweets all day. And, um, and most of those um, actions are uncontroversial, right? If there's yeah. some, like if something is flagged for just straight up um, targeted harassment or, you know, um, child porn or something like that, these are uncontroversial um, uh, 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 bans or suspensions. And so, you know, most most flag tweets that get actioned are 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 straightforward and non-controversial. And you'd have some low level person just flagging it, and then it automatically disappears. There's no need for a discussion for that to go higher up the chain. Right. The stuff that went higher up the chain was stuff that was either um, edge cases where you know the 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 low level people were like, I don't, I'm going to have to send this up the chain because I don't, I'm not clear on whether this is a violation or not. And then it would get discussed higher up. And there were several tiers like edge cases would get sent higher and higher up if they were, if they were, if people weren't able to make a determination down the ladder. And then the other situation, which it would get, get sent up is if they were like high volume accounts by prominent people right. where there was reluctance to take action, for example, Donald Trump, but also celebrities. <laughs> yeah. um, and, uh, and you know where we're like we're more reluctant to take action on this account or elected officials. Um, and mm-hmm. then and in those cases, uh, if it was a edge case and a prominent account, then oftentimes it would get the attention of these of the Yoel Roths of the world who who would who would then have to make these um, sort of um, judicial decisions um, on these things. And and so those were the conversations we often became privy to. Um, so that's so like a lot of the stuff that was was act that the 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 accounts that were acted upon lower down the chain, you know we 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 did we weren't seeing those. We had we had I suppose we did have vis we didn't have visibility in most of those decisions. But even if we did, we would have to be looking for that to 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 find it. And um, and given uh, you know, finite time and finite personnel. We were um, we had an agenda where we were looking for specific um, episodes and trying to plumb those. Um, and and we were so you know, there's a whole lot of stuff that we we weren't able to look into, unfortunately. Can I I want to ask you a question um, about Yoel Roth because I, I will admit because I do admit my own failings on this podcast frequently because I have so many, but um, <laughs> I. This is a guy who kind of rubbed me the wrong way when it was revealed that he was kind of the chief censorship dude. And Mm -hmm. I I did what I do. I went down a Yul Roth rabbit hole. I read all of his tweets. I um, watched some interviews he gave. And and I will be 100% honest with you. This is a guy I would not let anywhere near a censorship decision if he was the last person on earth, right? He was, he was, a a person who seemed utterly captured by uh, siloed thinking. In other words, the people you want thinking about censorship are the people who are the big the big thinkers. You know, the ones who were like, "Well, maybe we should let them march through Skokie. Like, maybe that's we have to do that in order to preserve this." I don't know. I'm going to think about it overnight. You know. That's what you want. You want people who struggle and they don't feel definitive and they're trying to to um, underpin a, a principle they know is kind of is actually worth dying for, right? Yoel Roth and, and his ilk in this story strike me as people who think they know way, way more than they do. And um and um And that makes me dislike them. I mean, there's one tweet where he says, well, no, it wasn't a tweet. Maybe it was an an interior document where he said, I can't be part of that meeting because I'm going to be on a vaccines panel at the Aspen Institute. Yeah. And I thought, what the hell? This guy knows nothing about vaccines or science or the history of vaccines and science or what the complaints are. And the Aspen Institute is like a nightmare, right? What a perfect pairing of stupidity. Um, and, And so... I, I see this type of character, this s- kind of smug, sure they're right and have the definitive answers on a lot of stuff they are absolutely not qualified to weigh in on. That's my rant about Yul Roth. Am I wrong about that? Should I be kinder? I agree with some of what you say, and I disagree with with other parts. Which so. Uh, you know, I've I've read a, a lot of Yal Roth's internal communications, and um, and 
I think that you are the part that I think you're right about is that, you know, he's utterly unqualified to be making a lot of the decisions that he's um, that he was uh, that it was his job to make. Yeah. Um, but um, but the part that I disagree on is that I actually you know, he's he's gotten a lot of he's gotten a lot of grief um, yeah. online. This stuff came out and not, you know, in part because Elon Musk called him out personally uh, a few times on Twitter. Yeah. Um, but I, I got to say that in a lot of these communications, he was the voice of restraint. Really? Um, wow. Yeah. Um, particularly with the Hunter Biden laptop. Um, so like, you know, there's, there's specific, Yoel Roth is the one who said in the communications around the Hunter Biden laptop story around the New York post story around the Hunter Biden laptop, he said, um, while I think, while I suspect that this is Russian disinformation, we in, we are lacking any definitive evidence that this is fraudulent. And therefore, um, this is, I do, I believe that this is not a violation of our policies. Wow. Um, so he 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 made a specific determination that this was that this was in that the Hunter Biden laptop story in the New York Post was in compliance, and he was essentially overruled by Jim Baker, who was deputy general counsel for Twitter, who was former FBI general counsel. Jimmy, um, Jim, Jimmy, we yeah, all and, yeah and, yeah. So there, and there were there were there was there were more, and that was the most high profile um, um, uh, scenario in which he played that role. But there were other ones too, in which he was, um, he, in which he was seriously grappling with the issues, and, wow. and when he showed a lot of restraint, and 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 basically said, you know, we should not um, uh, take action on this. Um, now he was not the most vociferous person in that respect. There were various like lower level folks who I think are kind of unsung heroes in yes. this. Yeah. Who um, whose whose Slack messages I read, I read, who were saying, who were going against the the group think and saying. You know, this is this is scary what we're doing, and yeah. this is disturbing to me what we're doing. Good, um, but I think what, but the Yoel Rothing story I think is very instructive because I think that, like, I think it's a misreading of the significance of the Twitter files to um, to draw the conclusion that a lot of people I think are drawing that the main problem was that we had these like overwoke, um, you know, hall monitor people yeah. in charge making these decisions who were over <laughs> the, 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 that's not really the story. The, so, so, the, so I think it's more accurate to say that there were a whole bunch of, um, yes, they, they were, you know, 99% liberal, um, like sort of left liberals, that's for sure. And very anti-Trump, um, definitely. Um, but well-intentioned people who were trying to make fair decisions. Um, but the, but that's the significance of the story is that all of those people could be extremely well-intentioned, um, extremely restrained in their actions. And it's still a problem that you have essentially the privatization of the public square, where you have all these people who are unqualified to be making these determinations, forced into a position to make these determinations. And by the way, I, I do think that Twitter was you know, I think it's also misreading to think that Twitter is power hungry and like salivating to censor people. I think that it was like they were facing this company was facing pressure from these outside agencies to Mm -hmm. do more and more censorship. The FBI was meeting weekly with Twitter. They were sending them flag lists of flag tweets every day. There was, there were many emails and, and, and Slack messages expressing on the part of Twitter employees expressing exasperation with the um, pace and, and, and production of these, um, of these flag tweets from the FBI. They were like, why is the FBI sent to, spending its time like s- searching through Twitter, looking for people who are violating our terms of service? There was exasperation at the FBI's, the amount of energy the FBI was putting in pressuring Twitter to, to, to take action on these accounts. So, you know, Twitter, I'm not trying to be exonerate Twitter or like it's be too sympathetic to Twitter because Twitter was part of the problem. But I think it's important for people to recognize that, like, I, I think a bigger part of the problem was, frankly, the FBI 
and um, and a lot of government agencies that were pushing Twitter to do more and more censorship and pushing this corporate. And basically, you know, it's like, look, the government is constrained by the First Amendment. And so they can't, you know, they, they can't directly tell people to shut up. But when the pro- when the when the the public discourse has, is taking place almost entirely on these private channels and these private companies, um, the gov- that's an opportunity for the government because these companies don't have to abide by the First Amendment. Yeah. And then the government can can then use its influence to sort of nudge and prod these companies to do what the government does not have the constitutional capability of doing itself, which is to silence these voices. And so you can have as many, you can have, you know, a, a room full, you can have a company full of saints making these decisions and it's still a problem. So I think that that's something that came across very clearly to me um, that it, it doesn't matter that the, that like the, the degree of nefariousness or virtuousness of the individuals making these decisions in a way doesn't matter. It helps for those, for, for, for these people that have moral integrity, but even if they all had a hundred, had great moral integrity, it's still a problem to have these these um, communications channels be privatized in this way. Well, yes, and but but the, I think there's so much to unpack here. But 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 part of it also is, you know, who was the genius? I mean, was it Jack Dorsey that hired the FBI guy as as general counsel? I mean, he 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 had Russia hoax all over him. Clearly, he was a Democratic Party operative. Mm-hmm. And and I do wonder if cynically he was put there um, because they thought he could smooth the way if there was any kind of regulatory challenge to something Twitter had done and that they were mm-hmm. paying the price for that by having what is clearly absolutely corrupt behavior. Right. So who may like who is responsible for enabling this kind of behavior within the Twitter hierarchy, even though some of the people there obviously, and I believe you, and it must have been difficult for them saying, what the hell is the FBI driving our agenda for? Did, did you discover how he ended up there? Um, no, that is going to require a whole lot more reporting that I hope is done, if not by, you know, myself and colleagues, by somebody. Yeah. But, um, but you know, this is this is part of Michael Schellenberger's uh, Twitter thread. Uh, num- I th- believe it was Twitter files number seven. Yeah. Um, where he goes into this. So like, so I, I'm not sure exactly what the hiring process was for Jim Baker, but I can say that you know, as as Michael discovered, there was a entire Slack group in, at Twitter called Bu Alumni, B U, um, short for Bureau. Um, it was an entire Slack channel for FBI alumni who what? were hired to Twitter and they had an entire like kind of onboarding protocol for new former FBI agents. So the, the FBI had like former FBI had essentially colonized the upper ranks of Twitter. There were just, there were a lot of former spooks um, uh, at that company. And I don't know, you know, that that's an interesting and important story to be told how that happened. Yeah. Um, Is it ever? But but what ended up happening with the Hunter Biden laptop story, it appears, is that while Yoel Roth, who's the guy who ultimately makes the final decisions about whether something is in violation or not, had determined that the laptop was not that the laptop story was not in violation, a, f- a couple of days later they went ahead and 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 pegged it as a violation and suspended, um, you know, f- froze the New York Post's account for a couple of weeks. Um, so he was essentially overridden by um, Jim Baker. Um, wow. We had, you know, uh, Michael uh, in his thread sh- shows an email from Jim Baker where he says, with no evidence, that um, that uh, that he that there's reason to believe that all the emails that are included in that story were fraudulent and that this was Russian disinformation. And then, you know, shortly thereafter, Twitter takes action on this story. So. It was sort of like the FBI had this this persuasion campaign to influence the decision makers at Twitter to make uh, to to take more and more action on these accounts that they believed that the FBI believed were somehow problematic. And then when that failed, um, they had kind of a a, a, a backstop um, uh, uh sort of uh, operation in place yeah. where uh, where they had all these um, FBI, former FBI people in the upper ranks of Twitter who could wield their influence from the inside. Yeah. Uh, 
so um so that that's also part of the story and uh and you know the 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 what we found at least in the time that we had to look at the twitter files we weren't able to uh we didn't have time to and we weren't and we didn't attempt to and we were probably wouldn't have been able to given the time constraints, the personnel constraints, tell that whole story. But you know, that, that, that's a story that can be told through, um, through traditional journalistic means in the future. And I think it's a really critical story to tell about how the FBI came to kind of take over the upper ranks of, these, the, the, of, of Twitter and Twitter is just one social platform. Like, you know, we're not, we haven't even gotten into meta and the other, uh, these other huge platforms that, presume you know it's hard to if they were doing it at twitter it's hard to believe that they weren't doing it at these other oh uh, oof, yeah uh, of course yeah well yeah but but then i guess the journalistic question is 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 why right like what why it, it it to me maybe i'm overstating it but it they're clearly they're trying to control the narrative not just for the status quo but for the democratic party so then then you have to ask yourself the ugly question about why is the fbi all in for the democratic party and when did that begin and i suspect here's my little breadcrumb for anybody following this but but i i wonder if all this didn't start like around 2015 2016 from the kind of corrupt Hillary Clinton wing of the Democratic Party that was infecting all kinds of places with operatives and and dishonest stories. Um, and that, I mean, let's not forget Peter Strzok. Like, can you draw a line between Agent Strzok's comments about Trump and, and as you said, quite brilliantly, the colonization of social media? Because here's what I think might have happened. The way when bad things happen, they're also preceded by a high higher purpose kind of nobility in the cause, right? That a lot of people in D.C. Um, actually thought, I mean, the Democrats thought it because they were opposition, but they actually thought Trump was this guy who was going to blow up the country with nukes and, you know, whatever. Um, and, and I'm wondering if part of the impetus for this back early on was that they were actually trying to do good for the country by making sure that somebody like Trump never got in again. And then it just became this, we're controlling the narrative for the Democrats or for the, you know, for a democratic administration. I touched on this actually in my most recent Substack, the one that um, article, the one that Elon Musk recently quote tweeted out, um, which is that, you know, I, I, I actually think that I actually don't think that it has to do with left, right. And with Democrats and Republicans, because, you know, you and I are both old enough to recall the 2003 run up to the rush to war in Iraq yeah. when mainstream media was completely in bed with the <laughs> yeah. Bush administration. Right. And yeah. like the New York times was, you know, was, was the outlet most responsible for facilitating um, the invasion of Iraq. Um, Our so, old friend, Judy Miller. <laughs> and exactly, curveball. Yeah. Exactly. So, like, so like, like, yeah. bear in mind that the media has played this role um, in the past for re for conservative Repu Republican administrations as well. In my opinion, it has less to do with liberal versus conservative or Democrat versus Republican than it has to do with insider versus outsider. Mm. Um, this is kind of very like, if you've read Martin Gurry's Revolt of the Public, it's very much kind of in that vein that like, I, like the reason why the FBI, in my opinion, is at the moment um, uh, so seems to be so um, in the tank for the Democrats um, is because, you know, the Trump was largely seen. I mean, bear in mind that Trump was like, you know, attacking the intelligence agencies. Yes, he was. <laughs> and, uh, so, you know, he was seen as an invader from the outside. He happened to be um, a Republican, but he was seen as the invader from the outside. And the Democrats took on the role of being the guardians of the center and of the status quo and of yeah. the, uh, of, of the, the, of the insider world in DC. So I think the FBI, you know, I think the law enforcement tends to align with, um, with the sort of the stable center uh, of the social order. And in, in, and at the, the current moment, um, the Democrats have become the party of sort of the, you know, the professional managerial class and the sort of the party of 
you know, the, the, Demo- the Democrat, Democratic voters are all like, you know, have, or at least the base voters have become super gung ho pro FBI, pro CIA. Um, you know, the, the, the politics have shifted where the Democrats have become much more the party of the establishment. Yeah. And the Republicans are now, you know, have this element <clears throat> that the FBI deeply distrusts of this sort of this populist um tier you know the 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 american equivalent of the canadian truckers yeah and so they hate it yeah so so i think i think that has a lot i think that has more to do with it than the than than the politics of it you could you could easily picture a world in which you know in 10 years this is inverted and um and they're sticking up for the republicans because the republicans are the party of the establishment you can picture that because it's happened before right when 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 uh, when the, the the law enforcement was much more distrustful of liberals and of Democrats because they were seen as the rabble rousers, so uh, I think really it's a, it's about insider outsider and the 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 left right stuff and the Democrat and Republican stuff is more of a distraction um, uh, to what is really going on in my yeah. opinion. Yeah, no, I think you're right about that. I that there that is the shift. I mean, it, it's a uniparty in uh in dc and um there's no absolutely no question about that but that is so disheartening um you know i my my bell was sort of rung when i saw vijaya getty or get gatta um and uh and jack dorsey who's kind of a slippery character in this whole thing and uh and someone else but i think tim pool on uh, Mm -hmm. joe rogan and and she was just monstrously monstrously um, dug in on, on the censorship issue. And I thought, Ooh, she's a very, very dangerous lady. And, Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm wondering, were her mittens all over this in your view, or was it larger? And, and Mr. Dorsey, who did say, well, the Hunter Biden laptop violated our hacked materials policy, which he knew at the time he said that was bullshit, unless he was being lied to, which he could have been. Um, Mm -hmm. what do you make of her and what do you make of him as this kind of detached, maybe malevolent, maybe just a dupe guy, um, who was running Twitter? I mean, I can't figure it out. Yeah. Um, I personally didn't get very far in, I did start to read Vijaya Gaddy's, um, uh, emails, um, but I didn't get very far just because I had, um, you know, limited time. So I, I I don't have as as personally as strong a sense of 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 her as I do of Jim Baker and, and yeah. y'all wrong. There are other people who are reporting on this who I think could speak on a more informed basis than I can to 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 what role she played. Um, but uh, but um, as Jack Dorsey, you know, he was he seemed just checked out to me. Like he was very yeah. checked out of this. Whole, I mean, that's been his reputation. Yeah, and um, and I think that. <laughs> You know, I think that he was, um, pardon, pardon my toddler in the background, by the way. We love toddlers. Um, it's fine. It's good. Um, but he, he was, um, I think he was checked out a lot of these decisions. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if he was being honest with his, with his, um, uh, uh, with his, uh, opinions on the Hunter Biden laptop story, because I wouldn't be surprised if he was being just told what to think by, you know, people beneath him and was just not really, uh, you know, he had plausible deni- deniability yeah. and also seemed to have a lack of interest in really micromanaging all of this stuff and putting his hands on it. Um, he comes up in the, in these communications in a very kind of peripheral way. That was at least my impression that like every once in a while, somebody would say, Oh, well, I think we've got Jack on board with this decision or that decision. And it was like, but it doesn't, you know, I was like, it was almost as if like they would, these underlings would make a decision and then they would consult with Jack and then they would report back. Okay. We managed to get Jack sign off on this yeah. rather than, Oh, we need to escalate this to Jack and Jack needs to make a decision on this. You know, it just felt very, it, it, it my impression was that he, he was as his reputation has, um, has, has um, indicated uh, that he was a very hands-off manager and um, and just somewhat checked out, and it was his lieutenants who were running the show. He's kind of kind of like Michael Scott <laughs> in the mm-hmm. Office, right? That he's kind of—I mean, he just he comes across as this kind of floaty, checked out weirdo who's who the smart people in the office are kind of managing 
around him in a sense, right? That they could like, I, I remember reading a very interesting profile of him, but he, he's very into biohacking. You know, he sort of gets up at five in the morning and he has an ice bath and he doesn't eat until dinner and he walks five miles right. to work and five miles back. That's what he's focused on. That's why he's so thin. Right. He's doing all these crazy things, right? Well, I think the ice bath actually might be good. But Yoga retreats. I remember famously he was like on yoga retreat for like three weeks or something. And like <laughs> just... I, mean, I, I have less, like, you know, for, to a lot of people who are <laughs> like me, big free speech advocates, um, Jack is seen as, Jack Dorsey is seen as some, as like a hero um, because he was kind of like seen as the guy who was at Twitter, who was really, you know, um, the, the one guy who was standing up for free speech at Twitter. I, I have a less sympathetic opinion of him, especially after reading the, really? through these Twitter files. Wow. Okay. Yeah, That's looks, interesting. Like, I think he had a responsibility to run this company according to, to the principles that he believed it should uphold. And I think he was just derelict in it. Um, I think that he, you know, if he, he had the power certainly to, to, to get, to deeply involved and to steer the ship in the right direction. And I think he was just kind of in a way observing her from the outside while just, you know, in by while being personally massively enriched by this company. I don't see that as a heroic role at all yeah. that, that he happened to have to say the right things about free speech while, you know, really not backing it up with any action. Yeah. So yeah, I'm, I'm you know. with you. I think that's probably true. And it, and it sort of begs the question that just because somebody is sort of clever enough to figure out whatever the kind of technology and the algorithms are to create something like Twitter, it doesn't mean you have the ability or the right mindset to be running a platform like this either, right? Like, one is one set of skills and one is another set of skills, right? They should have got like Harvey Silverglade or one of the early <laughs> free speech mm -hmm. lawyers, you know, to be sitting at the right hand of saying, I know this is really like unpleasant to let this tweet go, but it's important on principle. We got to let it go. You know, like that's, mm -hmm. and, but he doesn't think that way, right? He's a, he's a computer guy. He's a technology guy. And yet he's being handed, and asked to run an organization that really is not about technology, but rather about some of the most human things that we will argue about until the day we die, right? These are not those yeah. people. They're not those people, right? Yeah, that's right. I think that's exactly right. Yeah. Um, so I want to just wrap up. I know we we are running out of time here, but I want to wrap up with a couple of ideas because we didn't talk much about what they what you guys actually found, right? So I, I guess before I do that, let me just ask you this. So, so we know that there was this outside pressure. We know that the FBI was heavily, heavily colonizing Twitter. There were regular meetings, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I'm also wondering, was there a lot or any, in fact, any indication that the alphabet agencies were pressuring government officials or others who'd been interacting with Twitter? Like, did you find Tony Fauci calling up Vijaya and saying, you got to smack down these anti-vax people? Like, did anything like that happen? There, the CDC was uh, was was sending flag tweets. Um, I'm I'm sure that the NIH pipelined some of those tweets into the CDC. Um, you know, this getting a list of requests of, of violations from the CDC is uh, you know admittedly uh, a different experience than getting it from the FBI. Even if the FBI has no legal um, basis for ordering anything from Twitter. It's just scarier getting it from the FBI or yeah. feels more authoritative. It's more easy to ignore the CDC. That said, you know, in the, in the midst of a pandemic, um, the CDC does come with a certain amount of gravity, but they, but this, but yes, the CDC um, was sending lists of flag tweets to, to Twitter to, to, to review mm -hmm. Um uh, I don't think that their role was as pernicious just because I but just because they didn't have the um, the degree of influence over Twitter that the FBI did. Um, but you know they they certainly but and but then on the other hand, a lot of this the impetus for want, wanting to censor these accounts or or or, or uh, 
police misinformation, however you want to call it, came from within the building. You know, there was a lot more uh, affirmative motivation, I think, uh, at Twitter because they saw it as their moral responsibility to combat pandemic disinformation. Yeah. And, you know, and like, like with many of these things, um, you can have a lot of people who were very well intentioned and wanted like literally thought that they were trying to save lives and still end up with a really uh, terrible outcome. You know, in the, in this case, you've got uh, in fact, oftentimes those two things are correlated. You know, the more you think that you are on a righteous crusade, um, the worse the outcome becomes because you start to uh, assume a certain amount of moral arrogance. Yes. And that's how a figure like, you know, uh, uh, Jay Bhattacharya ends up being censored. Yeah. Um, you know, somebody who was right about all this stuff and who's a Stanford right. uh, 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 medical expert. Um, well, look at the so, difference between Jay, who happens to be a, a friend of mine, and and mm-hmm. and Fauci, who is not. Um, <laughs> I mm-hmm. covered him back in the AIDS days, so like I know him really well. Mm. But um, and look at the difference in how they present. You know, there's an expression that certainty is the last refuge of the fool, right? And and mm-hmm. any scientist who is saying I am science, I know it must be done this way, is is bullshitting you, and they shouldn't be in that job. Yeah. And Jay is this kind of gentle, thoughtful, prepared to to uh, admit a mistake. A, a guy I've had the privilege, really of watching kind of blossom under this incredibly hot spotlight of, uh, you know, smears and attacks and censorship, et cetera. And look at the difference between the two of them, Leighton. I mean, they're, they're, they're kind of polar opposites of each other, right? One representing actually the debate of science, which we need, and the other saying, no, 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 don't question me. I, I get everything right. I mean, the last time that I probably practiced science was 35 years ago, right? The guy... <laughs> Right. He's a politician yeah. and he's a bureaucrat manager. He's he, he's he at one point. Yes, he practiced medicine and science. Um, but, you know, that was that was a that was a that was a generate that was two generations ago. Um, he's so, you know, yeah, his his proclaiming himself to be science to to be to be the 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 very incarnation of science is just such a joke, not only because of how unscientific such a statement is, but also because um, the guy's a politician. He, he is not he is. He, he um, in his younger years, yes, he was a scientist, but that was a that was a lifetime ago. Yeah, um, he's 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 a creature of DC. He is a creature of DC. What a great way to put it. And and you know, I, I mean, I I love your level headedness about this. I think it's terrific, and it's actually quite good for me because I am still so spun out by having my worst fears confirmed about what was happening. Because you know, those of us who are c- kind of covering COVID. Um, every week, um, I, you know, it became my full-time job. It was so it was really hard. And, um, and I'm, I'm like seeing these people being like reading their work and saying, yeah, this is good. And it makes sense what they're saying. And then, and seeing them be censored and videos pulled from YouTube, you know, of the great Barrington people, why are they doing this? I mean, it really was, um, destabilizing for people this has been two and a half years of kind of, of like the ultimate gaslighting, right? And and yeah. those of us who were journalists saying, well, this is just not right. And these doctors are correct or probably correct what they're saying. And why why is this happening? Like I, I was really it was a real torment for me. Um, and having my worst fears confirmed didn't actually make it better. It made me more frightened about where where we might be going late. And I hate to say that, yeah. but um, what's yeah. your view of that? I mean, I think that Twitter is falling apart um, right now because. <clears throat> the company is just in utter chaos and meta is also, you know, been on the decline. Facebook is kind of um, like, I believe not at least in its current incarnation, not long for this world. So wow. I am, I mean, I, I don't want to put too much um, uh, credibility in that prediction, but it just feels like it's irrelevant to the younger generation and the company has not been, successful in in this metaverse initiative yeah it was um, stupid so like it was <laughs> like yeah stupid. it feels like it's a good more something else and like it, we've become so inured to the idea that social media runs the world that yeah that we our assumption is that you know if these titans fall <clears throat> then some other you know um, platform will take their place but the, but there's also the possibility that social media and it, it being the the main sort of organizing 
basis for our social lives is a um, it turns out to be a a a, a phase and a and a, a one sort of historical era yeah. that turns it different and that i don't believe that that means that we're all going to be like bowling together again <laughs> necessarily but but i do think that like maybe it becomes fragmented into different types of platforms that are not one to many like for example ethan strauss who's a writer who i admire has, has written about how you know the real conversations are, are taking place in signal groups and dm groups and these yeah. kind of like pr- private channels of a dozen or more you know a dozen or so people yeah. um those are where real meaningful conversations are taking place and only the kind of the bullshit performative um, superficial conversations are taking place on these one to many channels. And so like, you know, maybe that's what replaces it is that we start to have more intimate conversations online um, with smaller um, numbers of people and that that replaces um, these social media giants. So there's like, I am optimistic that, you know, this, that, I'm optimistic by the fact that these social media platforms don't seem to be in their healthiest state. And that maybe that means that we'll move on to something that's better for society after these companies um, kind of um, start to unravel. Yeah. Well, you know, I hope you're right because I, I feel like my analysis would be that mainstream media or legacy media, let's put it that way, um, is driven also by what happens on social media. And I, I wonder, although I think legacy media is completely corrupt and an absolute joke and should be ashamed of themselves and taken to the woodshed, um, I, I do think they were influenced. And I, I think maybe if Twitter was running the Hunter Biden story, maybe if Facebook was running it, maybe legacy media would have run it too. You know, I, I feel like they were feeding social media was feeding this bad uh, look they they can behave badly without social media there's no question but but i feel like the social media was maybe giving was maybe sanctioning some of the censorship that was democratic party driven on on the legacy c media so maybe that will change i don't know i you know, Leighton, I, I do a lot of shows about journalism and where it's going because i'm i'm tormented and upset to see what's happened in my business um, and mm-hmm. I, I don't know, you guys, all the people you named at the top of this show who worked on these files are heroes of mine in one way or another. Um, mm-hmm. And I admire you, but but um, I don't know how we kind of, how do we codify that? Like, how do we make you guys and some of the podcasters the go-to now? And, how, you know, how do we make that work for people? I, I don't know. I don't know, because mm-hmm. I still sit down at night sometimes and turn on, um, network news. <laughs> I <Yeah>. confess. <laughs> I, I'm screaming yes. while I'm watching it, but I do. And that just yeah. may be an old person's habit, right? That's what my kids mm-hmm. would say. Mom, you've got to stop doing that. But, <laughs> but how do we put you guys out front here now since you're the truth tellers? I don't know. Is there a solution? I mean, yeah. Barry Weiss has a great sub stack. I worship it. I go there. But, mm-hmm. but I feel like she's preaching to the choir. Like, how do we get the mm-hmm. CNN people over to Barry Weiss or to you or to whatever? What do you think? Yeah, I, that is a, I, I mean, that's a, that's the big question, right? Because media has become so siloed off that it's like, um, I don't know. I don't know if it's possible. Um, that's just the direction that media is taking is that we all um, are pigeonholed into our silos. Like, Barry with the free press um, can bring, can build a massive, massive audience and rival the New York times and still be sequestered into a, a, you know, into like just a tier of the country that isn't talking to the uh, other tiers. You know, it's Mm -hmm. like even the main, like even the, the New York times, which has become sort of the, the Amazon of mainstream media is its own little silo. Um, Oh, totally. It's laughable. No. Yeah. So you can get, you can get, you can become, you can create a media empire and still be in your own filter bubble. So it's, um, it's, that's a deeper sociological question that I, I, I do do not have the answer to and don't pretend to have the answer to. Well, you won't have heard this because I'm going to talk about it in my intro, but I'll leave you with this idea. Um, You know, so much damage was done to us in the last two and a half years on so many levels by lockdown, school closures, propaganda, et cetera, et cetera, Um, dividing us up and not letting us have the fellowship we need to survive and that sort of thing. 
And I, I realized the other day that, you know, government is not going to ride to the rescue with a remedy. They're not going to say, oh, all these kids are dropping out of school because of school closure. They're not doing that because they won't do anything that outs their own culpability in the complete mess they've made of our lives. And mm-hmm. I think that the only way forward now is for us to do it almost c- communally, that we, you know, we must have community organizations. This sounds so freaking old school, but where people are tutoring the kids who are failing, you know, for free, right? Where we are raising funds for the businesses that went under because of lockdowns, where we we, we don't wait for government or these big NGOs that hate us to ride to the rescue, that we have to say this is a problem they created, but we're going to solve it. And I think maybe that that includes media, that there has to be maybe a communal effort of some sort where people can get together in person and read stuff and talk about news stories and have live yeah, people come. And I'm, I'm, I'm Generation X, and that's like the punk rock DIY kind of uh, spirit. Yeah, yeah, oh. yeah. What would the dead Kennedys do, you know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that's what I'm thinking, because they're not going to try and fix a problem they won't admit they created, right? So I, I worry that there's, I, I, you know, I see up in Canada here, there was like six girls or eight girls, teenage girls between 13 and 16, I think, who murdered a homeless man on the street. They beat him to death. I mean, what the hell is going on right now? And um, I do feel these are mental health a- aftershocks that we've got to deal with in a, in a forthright way, you know? Yeah. 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 Anyway, Leighton, you're a hero of mine. Thank you for telling me that story. Um, you're welcome what it was like in there. That it sounds so fun. And uh, I'm glad it was you guys. And yeah. we're, we all owe you a huge, huge debt of gratitude for doing it. So thank you. Well, thank you for saying so. Yeah. Happy New Year. You too. Okay. Bye. Okay. Take care. Bye. That was Leighton Woodhouse. I just want to read to you what David Zweig, how he categorized what happened at Twitter vis-a-vis the COVID debate. This is from his tweet thread. The Twitter files, how Twitter rigged the COVID debate. Number one, by censoring info that was true but inconvenient to U.S. government policy. By discrediting doctors and other experts who disagreed. By suppressing ordinary users, including some sharing the CDC's own data. Right? Remember, they were censoring people who were saying that herd immunity included natural immunity. They were they were draw they were censoring those people. It's like ridiculous. And what we can say, and what I've been saying, and will continue to say, is that this censorship on Twitter and elsewhere in legacy media around COVID cost people lives. Right? It cost people's lives. People died as a result of it. No question about that. Um, I'm going to leave you with a wonderful Twitter thread that I found that very much explains my own political transformation. It's written by a guy named Jaded Nation. Oh, I get it. Aren't we all? Here's what he says. It's so smart. Just bear with me, please. During the Christmas gatherings, I was confronted by a liberal family member about me becoming Republican after having been one of the biggest lefties she's known Soapbox time, he says. I was a lefty. I thought I was a member of a group that distrusted big government, that distrusted big business, that distrusted big pharma, that distrusted the security state, that recognized that war is a tool of the elite, that believed in bodily autonomy, that believed in protecting children and cherishing the innocence of adolescents that believed that trad gender roles were confining, antiquated, and oppressive, that stood up for the working class, that believed in rights inherent to all people, that empowered, not enabled, the less fortunate, the marginalized, the damaged. Starting around 2015, I saw more opportunities to find common ground with people outside the group, more than ever in my lifetime. Instead of embracing these opportunities, the group took to altering their positions to become less welcoming. Trump and then COVID turbocharged this, and it became undeniable to me that the group I had thought I was in alignment with 
had no real ideology other than opposition. How true. I had remained right where I'd always been on most of my ideology, while the group had completely changed around me because the wrong people had become had begun to come around to some of the ideas it had. I'm not a lefty anymore, not because I changed, but because leftism in the U.S. was revealed as a sham. And yes, since then, some of my ideals have shifted. Escaping the group meant rethinking some of the ideas that had been implanted in me after becoming a card-carrying member. So this is so smart. Despite most lefties acknowledging this when pressed, they still remained steadfast in their belief that the only solution is to fix it so even more reliance can be placed upon it. They're talking about the state. And fixing it despite being often couched in radical sounding rhetoric. So I I thought that guy was quite smart. It's a really interesting Twitter thread. And I know that a lot of people are still struggling with the idea that they're politically homeless. We have a hat for that, by the way. And, um, uh, you know, it's, I, I think we just have to stop caring about that. I think we just have to be who we are. I read somewhere that someone was calling themselves a Quaker libertarian. That's pretty interesting to me, too. So um, I think we just have to open up to each other in ways both large and small. And next week, I am going to talk about this idea I have that I think we need to band together in our communities in small groups and start fixing the policy damage that happened as a result of COVID-19, not caused by the virus, caused by the policies around the virus. That's what we need to talk about because you know what? They are not going to do it because it means outing themselves. They won't do it. So we have to start talking about what that would look like. And uh, I think it's really important we do. And I think we'll feel empowered if we if we do start having that conversation, at least locally where we live. So think about that. If you have any ideas, do send me an email. I might read it on the air. And uh, in the meantime, stay critical. We'll see you. 